I'd like to welcome you this evening to the uh, evening's lecture. And on behalf of the lectures committee and student body government who funded this, the, uh, this evening we are, I think, very fortunate to have uh, our, our guest for uh, two, for, for at least two reasons. One uh, good reason is that uh, there's a great deal of ferment in China and a great deal of confusion in, I think, uh, the Western press about what is going on in China to a certain extent. And uh, if, you, if you've followed the press at all, you've noted that the present leadership has said over the past, say, six months, things like uh, the country can expect a hundred flowers in science and culture to bloom, and in particular, uh, that a new spring in art and literature can be expected. Now, this has raised all kinds of anticipations on the part of the Western press that uh, all kinds of things are going to happen. And uh, uh, you find projections based upon some of these statements uh, that things uh, will change in the arts and the sciences. Things will, uh, uh, we will find uh, new uh, currents and uh, new uh, cultural achievements, perhaps. Uh, and if you look at the reports in the last several months, uh, and even in the last month, for example, you can find reports that things are changing in China. And I'll just give you a couple uh, as illustrations. Uh, Peking Radio, it is said, now airs, quote, lilting folk songs and traditional Chinese music, which apparently they didn't do in the past. Uh, recently, a Canadian brass quintet uh, visited China and played music from Bach to Beethoven, music that was heavily criticized as reactionary two or three years ago. Uh, the quintet was praised in the People's Daily on March 26th as, or was praised for its, quote, skill, fidelity, and interpretation and lively, bright performance, which left the audience with a deep impression, end quote. Uh, these are the signs of the new spring, apparently. Uh, and uh, it's, but it's a very difficult thing to, to deal with, I think, uh, because we've got, uh, for one thing anyway, we have a distorted Western journalist, or Western journalist distorting, uh, variety of events and occurrences in China and interpreting things. And, in, and if you read their commentaries, they are essentially s perceiving this as a, a great uh, sign of progress, that China is coming around finally uh, to the Western view of things, uh, that there is, uh, uh, that, you know, that the, the Western approach to, uh, to the arts, for example, is the, is the uh, way to go, the only way to go. Uh, we have a problem here. Uh, this could be a pattern of continuity where uh, we're jumping, I think we're jumping the gun quite a bit. It's difficult to tell what, the, what these, all these uh, events mean. And another problem we have is just how much of a lid really was on the creative arts in China, the performing arts in China, uh, over the past 25 years. Uh, and then, of course, the projection question is, what kind of changes can we expect in the next decade or so? Uh, these are the types of questions that are being raised, at least in, Western, in the Western press on China. And I think we uh, are very fortunate this evening uh, when we have a, a lecture titled The Theater in Revolutionary China, or The Theater's Role in Revolutionary China, uh, that will uh, <coughs> raise, perhaps, some of these issues or maybe clarify them for us at least. And the second reason of, that we're very fortunate here is that we've got somebody who, who has experienced uh, the whole thing. As Chairman Mao said once, if you want to know the taste of a pear, you have to taste it, uh, or something to that effect. <laughs> and uh, in our case tonight, I believe we have somebody who has, knows a, a great deal. She trained at the Shanghai Dramatic Academy, uh, graduated there in 1952, and from 1952 to 1971, she worked with the Shanghai People's Arts Theater, performing primarily in plays about the history of China in the past 150 years, but also in some Western authored plays. Thus, she has been directly involved in her, uh, in the subject that, that she's talking about. She brings to us uh, uh, certainly a, a whole new dimension of China that we haven't really investigated here at all before. I believe we are in for a very stimulated evening, and I'm very pleased to introduce Chen Yuan Chi. Well, since 1972, uh, there are at least 
8,000 to 10,000 Americans have uh, visited China in the past five years. Plus, of course, uh, maybe a few hundred or over a thousand American Chinese have gone back um, for visits in China. So uh, I think a lot of uh, Americans here now uh, know something about China uh, and have visited a few cities, communes, and uh, factories, and usually brought back, uh, at least I think openly, I've always heard very favorable remarks about what's going on in China, uh, probably privately have some doubts about what they have seen in China. Uh, that's very natural because uh, for a few weeks uh, and with a guided tour, uh, what you can see is very limited. And particularly when you try to interpret it, you'll find it very difficult. So <clears throat> uh, for me to speak here tonight, I would uh, uh, want to explain that because of my own upbringing and my education and my work in China, um, I'm used to certain concepts, particularly when in my talk, I'm used to certain terminologies, which may sound very uh, strange to you or even you know, very repulsive to you because you're not used to it. Uh, but to me, it comes very natural. I try to uh, modify it so, so you can, <laughs> you can uh, accept it or you can understand it easier for you to understand. But I, I, don't, I think if I worry this too much, I worry about this too much, then you know, uh, I won't be able, able to speak very um, um, openly or very um, uh, straightforward with you. So I, I think I'll, I'll try to um, explain everything uh, which I have experienced uh, I observed in my, during my lifetime in China, and if you have any questions, um, we, you can raise after my talk, and Jerry and I both would be willing to answer any questions. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, like Adrian said, that China is uh, experiencing at now, uh, at this moment, some changes. It's not quite clear yet, but uh, it's bound to have some changes because just in the past year, China lost three major leaders who had founded the People's Republic of China. Uh, Zhu De was the first one and then followed by Zhou Enlai and then Mao Zedong. Uh, last September, he died. Um, so um, what Chinese Revolution, Mao Zedong led the Chinese Revolution and he paved the way for the Chinese people to, to march along this road. Uh, and he set up all kinds of guidelines and policies in every field for the Chinese people to, to carry it out. Uh, so up to this point, uh, what the Chinese followed was Mao's line, basically. Uh, although in, during certain years, in the past, uh, from 49 to 76, there were times when uh, other policies prevailed in China in a very short period, particularly in the early 60s, from 60 to 62. But basically, uh, Mao always could bring back uh, the, um, push, push the Chinese people along the way that he wanted, he, that he had uh, charted for the Chinese. So what my own experience uh, was based on uh, Mao's guidelines and because uh, what we went through in the Cultural Revolution was to um, review our work, reevaluate our work, and uh, uh, criticize ourselves and really understand what Mao wanted us to do. From the beginning, I want to um, first introduce you to, to, the, a very, to a very different concept of art and literature. Um, that is, the role of theater in the Chinese Revolution. Uh, 
The revolution I ref I'm referring to is the revolution which led to the founding of the People's Republic of China under the leadership of Chairman Mao. At the very beginning of this revolution, the Chinese Communist Party made it very plain why it is necessary to include art and literature as a component part in the revolution. The theory behind this is, as Chairman Mao stated in his article on New Democracy, which he wrote in 1940, which says, quote, revolutionary culture is a powerful revolutionary weapon for the broad masses of the people. It prepares the ground ideologically before the revolution comes and is an important, indeed essential, fighting front in the general revolutionary front during the, general, during the revolution. And here I might I add, after the revolution, its sole task, the art and literature's sole task, task is to serve the economic base and to consolidate the new revolutionary power. This is the principle Mao had set for art and literature. So in practice, how does it function? The Chinese Revolution always had two armies, the army with guns and the army with pens, as we say, which means the cultural army. The Communist Party acknowledges the importance of army with guns to win the revolution. Of course, Mao had always said the power comes from a barrel of gun. It always deemed, but at the same time, it always deemed the cultural army as absolutely indispensable for uniting her own ranks and defeating her enemy. So put in practice, from the very early days, in the Red Army days, that was when Mao was fighting the nationalists from the mountains in Jingang Mountain it, during those days. And then afterwards, the long march from Zunyi all the way to Yan'an, 7,000 7, miles long march. And in the years of war of resist resistance against Japanese aggression, followed by the war of liberation from 45 to 49. And after the liberation of the whole nation, except Taiwan now, the theater art carried out the tasks outlined by Chairman Mao, which combines education, propaganda, and entertainment in performing arts. In the tough years of civil war between the nationalists and the communists from 1927 to 1937, hundreds of cultural teams were formed, which consisted of song and dance, skits, living newspapers, Peking operas, and its variation of provincial local operas, folk arts, all kinds of theat theatrical art forms which were familiar and acceptable to the masses of people. These cultural teams, which were formed by the Communist Party, marched alongside with the Red Army, and they produced programs to inspire and educate the army. Uh, many of the, their programs were quite successful and lasted until today, it remains to be very popular with the workers, peasants, and soldiers. And these cultural teams not only perform for the army, but in times of actual fighting with the enemy, the men in the cultural teams turned into medical evac evacuation teams, and the women became first aid nurses. So they helped the fighting. And after the Red Army entered into a new territory, taken in a new ter ter territory, it was the task of the cultural teams to calm the fears of the people, of the local people, explain the policies of the co Communist Party so as to, one, to, to win the confidence of the people. All of these were done in art forms. You know, it's not just talk, but they would 
produce immediately skits or song or whatever art form which would be very familiar to the, this particular local people and the cultural teams would produce programs just to explain the policies of the Red Army and the policies of, uh, of the Communist Party and to calm their fears and make them accept the, uh, the Red Army. So in the process of consolidating the liberated areas and carrying out various political programs, the cultural teams would produce programs and they would coordinate with the political movements. This has always been the tradition of theater arts under the leadership of Communist Party all the way until 1949. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, the conditions for the theater people had changed for the better. More, their lives were more stable and they have better equipment and communications, plus cultural, change, cultural exchange with foreign countries became uh, possible and gradually increasing after 49. Then this exchange with foreign countries, which has both its positive and negative effects on the Chinese people. Although the principle of the theater arts remained the same, there were times the cultural workers, as we call them, because in China um, we don't call artists, we, call, we don't call them artists, uh, we call them cultural workers, uh, so as to make it clear that uh, they are not a special group of people who are um, divorced from production workers or peasants in the countryside to indicate that this is just a division of labor between people. So you work in cultural field, you're called cultural worker. He works in the factory, he's a production worker. So the cultural workers, after 1949, because of the change of conditions, um, at times, the writers and, and uh, actors working in the cultural field deviated from the guiding lines set, set up by Mao. The deviation was caused by the easier living con conditions and outside influence. And the confusion, the confusion, what is the confusion? The confusion is who should we serve first? Are we going to serve the workers, peasants, and soldiers, or are we going to place more emphasis on serving intellectuals and bourgeoisie in the city. Because in the Red Army days, there was no confusion. Of course you serve workers, peasants, mainly peasants, really, because you went through all the rural areas, mo mostly the Red Army, what they took over was rural areas, so you serve the local people, they're all peasants. But once, uh, after the founding of the People's Republic, then you march into those major cities where you have lots of uh, um, intellectuals and you have uh, lots of uh, national bourgeoisie in the big cities. So <clears throat> who should we serve first? This became a question. The other question was whether we should, the relationship between popularization and elevation of art and literature. Should we popularize first, or should we raise the standard first? This is one question. Follow this question is, use what kind of form and content to popularize, and toward which direction to raise our standard? You see, who set up the standard? What is supposed to be the highest standard for art and literature? How do we measure it? If we follow the Western standard or the, or we in China would say the bourgeois standard, which means we should elevate our art and literature towards the direction of Western bourgeois art and literature, which means if we reach that standard, then we're perfect. If we don't reach that standard, then we are low. Is that the way to measure it? This is a very important question. These confusions made 
the cultural workers at times forget what is needed and can be accepted by the workers, peasants, and soldiers, and became overly enthusiastic in raising the standards of art and literature to the heights of the feudal bourgeois or petty bourgeois intellectual standard, which, as we found out later when we review our work, was a disservice to the workers and peasants because the result of this kind of elevation was undermining the efforts of the workers and peasants and soldiers um, in, in their effort to build a new socialist China. The well-publicized Cultural Revolution started in 1966 was a review of the cultural work from 49 to 66 on a massive scale, inviting the whole nation to investigate and reevaluate the role of culture in a socialist construction. And in its process, the Cultural Revolution touched upon the political and economic fields. Now here I want to pause for a little while and introduce my own work and my own background. In 1949, uh, I applied to study acting in Shanghai Dramatic Academy. Uh, before that, I had interest in, uh, in theater because of my family. My, you, in, during the war years in Chongqing, my family was in Chongqing. At, in the theater arts were very, uh, were blooming in Chongqing because they produced lots of those plays um, concerning the war against the Japanese, and uh, they w we had many uh, good actors in Chongqing. So my when my parents used to take me to the theater, so I I, I became very uh, interested in theater. But in those days, uh, in China, the at least uh, I'm talking about the uh, areas uh, nationalist government was uh, in control. Uh, the status of uh, theater people, whoever worked in, you know, in the cultural field, uh, wasn't very high. Uh, you, particularly the actresses were looked upon not too differently from uh, uh, prostitutes uh, because uh, of the uh, theater were mostly controlled by, by the gangsters and they would force with the actresses to do whatever they want them to do. And if you want to be in that field, you want, if you were really after fame and position, then you would compromise yourself um, intellectually and physically. So <clears throat> that's the reason that the, the status of theater people, particularly actresses uh, in the society was uh, very low. So although I was interested in, in theater, but I never thought I would enter that field before 1949. But uh, when liberation came in Shanghai, uh, there were troops, cultural troops, uh, which were uh, sent from the liberated areas because there were one quarter of Chinese territory uh, long before 49 was under the control of the Communist Party. And the, uh, like I said, they had their own cultural teams. They had their own production. They had their own tradition. So when 49 came, of course, Shanghai became uh, a new territory for the Communist Party. So you follow their tradition. The cultural troops were all sent in uh, to this big city to educate us in Shanghai. So uh, we saw many of those new productions and traditional you know, liberated area productions, um, like White Hair Girl was in opera form at that time and also the several dramas, one, one of them called uh, the, um, the, mm, the Enemy Without Gun, uh, which means the hidden enemy, um, a KMT, a Kuomintang agent, you know, this kind of uh, plays, drama. And we, uh, I went to see these plays and I was quite moved by some of them and I find uh, the acting style was very, very realistic and uh, I could tell the actors in those uh, plays were really uh, 
part of the masses because they, they, they behaved and they projected, they depicted these uh, peasants or soldiers on the stage so realistically, you know, you, 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 you're bound to be moved by them and forget that these are the actors, you know, as if really a real slice of life uh, depicted on the stage and it was very fresh for us. So, uh, on the other hand, also uh, the publications, you know, right after 49 when the Communist Party took over Shanghai, um, the publications emphasized on, on these kind of cultural activities and they had uh, you know, evaluated these uh, works very highly. So we could see that the, um, the whole concept of art and literature was changing. And uh, the social status of these kind of people uh, was quite different from uh, what we looked upon you know, theater people before 49 in the uh, nationalist areas. So I became interested and thought, you know, well, now it's different. Um, nobody looked down upon these kind of people, and they, actually we looked up to them because they, they gave us such fresh ideas. So uh, I talked to my family. I said, what about it? Because th at that time, the Shanghai Dramatic Academy was uh, uh, started to enroll students. So I said I wanted to go. Uh, um, I convinced my sister and my mother uh, quite easily because uh, they, they saw things you know, more or less the same as I did. But uh, my father was a little uh, behind. He wasn't quite convinced that it's changed that much. Uh, so he objected. He said, well, can you find something else more worthwhile to do with your life? So I said, well, it's changing. It's not the same as before. Nobody really would look down upon me if I be become an actress. Um, so, but he wasn't convinced. So finally, it <coughs> I went uh, to apply and I went through the examination anyhow. Um, but after I was accepted, uh, at that time, you see, right after liberation, wasn't completely free. We had to pay a little bit of tuition fee. Uh, so uh, my father didn't want to give me that tuition fee. Uh, finally, of course, uh, you know, in China, wives, uh, although nowadays, of course, women are very uh, independent economically, but even then, um, in 49, I guess my mother uh, could, because the fee wasn't that large, so she could gave me out of uh, family expenses, I guess. So she gave me the fee, and uh, I, I, went to, I went to the Dramatic Academy. That was the first year, of course. After that, uh, things became very clear. I, I didn't have any trouble. So uh, that was how I enrolled in the Dramatic Academy. Uh, since then, uh, I became a member of the Chinese theatrical circle uh, until I left China uh, in, at the end of 71. Uh, so to be an actress or a cultural worker in China uh, is something very different from any other parts of the world, I think. Uh, of course, I, that's my, my, my thinking. Uh, maybe there are places in this world similar to Chinese situation. Um, but from what I read uh, about uh, other countries, even other socialist countries, uh, I, I find it still quite different. Uh, because the importance of the Communist Party placed on culture, uh, the responsibility of cultural workers in China has great, greatly increased. Uh, we are not looked upon as just entertainers. Rather, we are more like educators. We are told it is our responsibility to use the form of theater arts to interpret <coughs> the revolutionary programs and party policies and to set moral standards in society and to inspire the people towards building a new independent socialist China. Any cultural worker in China who try to seek self-expression 
seek limelight, fame, or position. Sooner or later, this person, this actor, or whatever you are doing in, in the cultural field, would be subjected to severe criticisms. The periodical rectification movements in the cultural circles are just aimed at this kind of people. So in order to perform our responsibilities as cultural workers and gear to the guidelines set up by the Communist Party, the Chinese cultural workers have to obtain the stand and the viewpoint of the workers, peasants, and soldiers to remote our world outlook, to see the society and the world through the eyes of the workers, peasants, and soldiers. To put these in very con concrete terms, this means we have to in integrate ourselves with the workers, peasants, and soldiers. We have to go to the countryside, go to the factories and army camps, not as visitors or just as uh, a person go there to collect material for my, for my production or to be an observer in these places, but to live, work, and study with them from time to time. Try to get them to accept us as one of them. This is necessary because it is the only way we would be able to understand their inner thoughts their feelings, and their inspirations. And our work is precisely to portray the heroes among the workers, peasants, and soldiers. Our theory for creative work is to combine revolutionary realism with revolutionary romanticism, which means we are not acting only as a mirror of the society but we also have an ideal which we wish to fulfill. When we depict a person on the stage, we depict a piece of life of society on the stage, we are not trying to depict them as it stands now, but as a society or a human being should be in the future. This is when the romanticizing comes in. In practice, the heroes on the stage would become the models in daily life for people. The impact of art and literature on shaping the social moral and the behavior of human beings in society is so great. So from our own experience, the cultural workers in China feel they have a very great responsibility and also they feel it's a challenge if you can really help shape the society and shape the behavior of human being. Now we have, throughout our work in China, uh, from my own experience, we have positive examples of our work but we also have negative examples of our work. And this is very good because we learn from these negative examples um, so we know what to prevent. Uh, you see, we put on all kinds of plays uh, in, in the 50s and in early 60s. Used, used to be we, uh, we have an uh, annual schedule of say we want to put on 12 plays for this year. Then we have one third of our plays selected from Western classics. One th what Western classics and what modern, Western modern contemporary uh, plays, we select four of them. And then we select one third from the Chinese classics. And then we have one third from Chinese contemporary, which our uh, playwrights in the theater would create or if some other theater has a new play, we can always take, take it from them. So it's one third. This is the proportion we maintained for many, many years. That's why we, ha we produced all kinds of play in the 50s and 60s. And 
because we always collect uh, reactions from the audience, we called seminars, we, we select representatives from uh, different groups to talk to us, and also they would uh, send in letters about their, uh, their comments, their, their criticisms, or their praises to us. So <clears throat> we can evaluate the work, uh, our own work. And there were also direct reactions when we put on a play on the stage. For example, we, we put on the, now I'll give you the positive examples, uh, which we put on, one play was called Zhao Xiaolan, which was a, a play wrote for the, uh, during the period of 1952 when the marriage law was uh, proclaimed in China. Uh, there, this was uh, because this was the first uh, law after liberation and uh, trying to protect the rights of women and children. And this was a play about a peasant girl who uh, once understood the uh, law, the marriage law, who had enough courage uh, to stand up for her own rights, who uh, in, the, in, the, in the play, she was among the first ones in the countryside um, to have a free choice of her own lover. Uh, but of course, in, in the process, he, she had to fight with her father, fight with, uh, with the mat, uh, matchmakers, uh, this kind of, uh, this story. And uh, after we produced this play, we took it to the factories and countryside too. And we find the reactions, because that was closely connected with the, with the movement during that period. Everybody was in, you know, studying that marriage law, and everybody was discussing about it, and was a upheaval in the society because it was such a, you know, it's a breaking point uh, in China, particularly in the countryside. Uh, the feudal system was so uh, deep-rooted, uh, whereas, you know, a young girl looking for her own lover and have a free choice that was, a, that was unheard of before, you know, and was looked upon as, uh, a, as a scandal if, if a young girl was going around with, uh, with her own choice and uh, you know, fighting for her own rights. So when we put on this play, of course, the hero, the heroine in the play was such a young girl. Um, so in the, when we presented this play, we get reactions directly from the audience because the audience immediately you know, uh, relate to this kind of, some relate to this young girl sympathize with her, some uh, was, you know, those older generation, those particularly uh, probably fathers or mothers you know, were really resentful that uh, we put on this young girl as the herring on the stage, and this was, you know, what kind of uh, impact. So <clears throat> you get, you know, particularly the Chinese peasants and workers, we, I love that kind of audience because they are so straight and they are so, enthusiastic. Also, they are so, uh, how do you say, uh, if they feel something, they are expressed right in the audience. You know, you, you, this way you get the direct reaction and you really, you know, you say they are not so sophisticated. You know, not like we have intellectual audience. You never get anything from them because, <laughs> <laughs> because you know, they, they feel if I, if I express myself, maybe that shows I'm not sophisticated enough, so I have to hold in. If I want to laugh, I ha laugh halfway. If I want to cry, I cry halfway, you know, never show my emotion. But this has no problem with workers and peasants, you know. They, they, all, they agree with you, you know, you, when the young girl was fighting with her father, and uh, the, you, you have people from the audience shouting slogans, supporting, right on, go ahead, you know, this kind of, uh, and, the, and then you have uh, uh, the other side, with a boo, woo, you know, this, because they disagree with, the, with this kind of uh, behavior on the stage. So <clears throat> this in turn inspired the actors. I think, you know, any actor would appreciate this because uh, even if you're not so, you know, emotionally involved in this, in this role, just because of this kind of reaction from the audience, they really push you right into that. So I, uh, I find this kind of, uh, you know, reaction, this kind of direct um, um, exchange with the audience was uh, very, very um, exciting and very, um, 
a very good experience, and we know immediately that uh, you know our work has some kind of impact on people's thinking. Uh, so <coughs> it's true we get the result because um, after the after the show, you know, you s we because we when we go to a uh, local area in the countryside, uh, we usually stay there for a few days. Uh, and during the day, we would uh, visit those peasants. If they're working in the field, we try to help them in the field so we can talk to them. And uh, then in the early afternoon, we start to uh, prepare for our show. And so we have some uh, um, dialogue with the, with the audience during the day so we can ask them what you feel the next day, you know, uh, how do you feel about a play, you know, what do you talk about? So you get immediately the remarks about certain people feel very encouraged because they see this is a policy and because the heroine won in, this, in the play and they, in the process, of course, you explained you know, what is the government policy now, you know, what, what we are encouraging. So, <clears throat> and some people, if they have some problems there in their mind, they, they can't accept this kind of uh, uh, new policy, uh, they also can express it and, and we can explain more during the daytime when we are talking with them. So this kind of uh, uh, exchange and this kind of experience, I find it's, uh, you know, from my ex description, I think you can find, you know, not only we use our, our profession to, to depict something and uh, trying to explain something, but we follow up with our dialogues with the audience. So it's uh, quite an quite a educational uh, process both for them and for ourselves. So in the process, we understand more, you know, what what's their inner thought, you know, how they react to this kind of policy, how they react to this kind of relationship. So uh, this is one example. I think it's quite positive in my car in my career. Uh, of course, there are other contemporary plays uh, when we depict some kind of you know positive character from the workers and peasants. And if we depict it correctly, uh, you often get this kind of positive reaction. But we also have negative examples, uh, the kind of play we, we put on. Uh, and like I said, we used to put one third, one third, one third. So we did put on some uh, Chinese classics. Um, uh, one of them is uh, uh, written by Cao Yu. Uh, he, he, you know, he's a very famous Chinese writer. Uh, he's very respected until today. He's re very respected, but he's also a very, very honest writer. Uh, after 49, he only wrote two plays. Uh, one in the early 50s, he wrote about the uh, medical doctors uh, whom, you know, uh, considered, you know, these higher intellectuals and who these kind of people he was very familiar with because he himself came from a uh, landlord uh, background and he was educated here before liberation. So uh, he, he never really understood uh, workers, peasants, and soldiers in China. Uh, and he's very honest about it. He tried, but he just felt he couldn't write them in, in depth. So he, he, he just never produced a play about workers, peasants, and soldiers. Uh, the next play he, he produced in the um, was late 50s, he wrote another play, it was a historical uh, play, Dan Jian Pian. It was about mm. the, uh, the, the, the feudal war between uh, Wu and Yue dynasty. That was another historical play. That was all he produced uh, after 49, but he's respected because very, uh, he's very honest with his, with his trade and he never tried to fool anybody. So, and he has experience, he has writing technique, but just because he couldn't, he can't understand workers, peasants, soldiers, so he can't write about them, that is all. Um, but we produced one of his play, one of his plays he uh, produced in the 30s, uh, the Lei Yu, oh no, Sunrise, Ri Chu, uh, Sunrise. Uh, the story was about, um, um, you would call uh, her a high-class prostitute uh, in the in the 1930s, and uh, it, it could could be interpreted as a tragedy of or a victim of that society. You know, he she was a she 
she was a high class prostitute. She was surrounded uh, by you know, people like banker, stockbroker, and uh, uh, homosexual, and um, you know, all kinds of uh, people that she had to deal with. But she has conflicts in her own mind because she, um, she, was, she was tempted to that kind of life, and then she, she find it was empty, and she, w she wanted to get out, but she couldn't get out, and finally she committed suicide. Uh, in, it, you know, she was caught up in that situation. Um, she couldn't get out of it, and she was agonizing over her own a guilty conscience, and, and uh, she couldn't get along with the people, this kind of people, any, any longer. Finally, he commit, she committed suicide. That was a story about this, this woman. And uh, you see, when we por apportioned us ourselves to put one third, one third, one third, you see, after 49, even you know, from our professional uh, viewpoint, every play we want to put on, we have to give some kind of social meaning, you know. You can't just say, I want to produce this just because this play is wonderful, uh, just uh, because the uh, characters are so vivid and we want to produce it. No, this is not good enough. You have to find out uh, to present to the, to the committee or to the leadership that uh, why, what kind of social meaning mm, this play would uh, have if we produce it. So for this play, we, ha we found the social meaning uh, which was uh, for the younger generation in, in China who had never lived uh, that kind of life and who never saw that kind of life before. Uh, maybe we, it's, it would be helpful if we pre present uh, this kind of play and to depict that, kind, that period of um, Chinese history and that particular uh, sect of life uh, show them you know, how decadent that was and show them you know, uh, this woman became the victim of that kind of society. So that was the ration, uh, rationale of our play. But when we presented it in uh, 1959, uh, we got reactions from the audience. Uh, first of all, um, the audience uh, was uh, a little different from other contemporary plays, which means we attracted more um, national bourgeoisie in the city uh, who were familiar uh, with that, that kind of life before, maybe who had lived that kind of life before uh, 49. Uh, and also we uh, attracted more intellectuals from, uh, um, from government agencies and from uh, universities, you know, these people who uh, who read more or who uh, who have some kind of background of uh, pre-liberation life uh, or usually that kind of people we have uh, in our audience and uh, of course we also uh, a small portion of the audience because we have service you see every time uh, when we sold the ticket we'll try to figure out uh, who came to see us, uh, you know, how, how many, what, what's the proportion of uh, production workers, what's the proportion of uh, administrative uh, workers and other, other kind of audience. So <clears throat> for this play, uh, usually we attracted that kind of audience and a small portion of uh, school students and, uh, and uh, workers. But the reaction from the, from the uh, audience um, uh, was not so positive to us when we review it. Uh, because uh, first of all, uh, the most outrageous one, of course, uh, was we got telephone calls from audience who asked our costume designer that where can she buy the same kind of high heel shoes whom the heroine wore in the play, you see, because we reproduced that piece of life, right? And the research was good. So all the, you know, the costume, everything was according to that period of uh, history. And evidently attracted somebody in the audience and uh, she, she looked around, she couldn't find that kind of shoes in the, 
in a shoe store, so she wanted to find out where we got it so she can go and try and buy a pair or something. You know. and, uh, and the hairstyle, you see, because um, the heroine was that kind of hairstyle and some audience was interested in the hairstyle and asked the makeup, you know, the, where, which, which, who, which hairdresser that we, we had uh, uh, hired. So this kind of reaction that um, gave us a feeling that uh, this certainly was not the purpose of our play. And we didn't anticipate that we would arouse this kind of interest among people. Uh, uh, you see, the social meaning we had put in that play uh, didn't uh, have the, uh, didn't realize, right? We, um, not, not many people wrote to us and telling us, you know, oh, you know, now I understand how decadent that society was. And, you know, no, we didn't get that kind of mail and we didn't get that kind of reaction. So, which means we failed. Uh, if if that, that was our purpose, uh, we failed. This was uh, one example that uh, we find, you know, the, our motivation or, or at least our outward purpose uh, uh, didn't, didn't come true. And uh, another, another example uh, was uh, similar because we produced Western classic and we produced Camille, a French play. You know, the storyline was about the same and the, we also justified it with the same reason, say, show the French decadent society and that kind of thing, you know, the hypocrisy of that society. You know, how, what, what drove Camille to suicide, right? So <clears throat> This, this, uh, uh, this play uh, we, we produced, and sure enough, uh, we, we, we didn't, our purpose didn't, didn't come true. Uh, instead, now we also got some outrageous reactions, you see. Um, because that was more serious, because we got a letter, uh, actual letter from uh, high school students uh, in Changsha City. Uh, who said, you know, oh, oh, I was so moved by the play. Uh, ev evidently, you know, the heroine acted very well. Uh, she was so moved. She cried so <laughs> bitterly for her. And, uh, but in the end, she said, in the letter, she said, I wish I could live even one week the life of Camille. <laughs> <laughs> then I would die with my eyes closed. That means, you know. This, so, this was much more serious, you know, than asking about shoes and hairstyles because <laughs> this was deeper. You know, why, why this, uh, this young girl who was brought up in a socialist society uh, would want to live the life of Camille? So our, our presentation was wrong. Or um, because the kind of social meaning we want to extra extract from the play really isn't there. You know, we, we just trying to put something on this play and, uh, and uh, but actually, you know, the writer of that play uh, didn't have the same kind of purpose as we have. Uh, so the end result is that, you know, we affected some young people's thinking and uh, made a misrepresentation of, of uh, that society. Uh, we, we evidently misled her. So. So this was another example. And I think, you know, aside from our stage show, shows, in our daily life, we also could tell that the impact of art and literature is so great. Uh, you see, I can tell you a story about my own colleagues. Uh, you see, in China, adultery is a punishable behavior. Uh, and uh, uh, because we want to protect uh, the uh, family life, uh, because we think family uh, life is very important. Family unit is uh, the basic unit in society. It should be protected. So <clears throat> uh, adultery is frowned upon and uh, can be punished. So one of my colleagues, uh, she, she committed this because she has three children, but uh, she had an affair with another guy and um, they were discovered and uh, she was being criticized in our group. Um, 
And the first time, usually the first offender is um, uh, not too serious, you know, because uh, we, f we find that maybe, you know, she had some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain it, uh, maybe just, just go astray once, right? So uh, we try to uh, talk to her, you know, in a group saying this is wrong, this is, uh, this is, you shouldn't do that because you would disrupt other people's life and all that. And then uh, after some time, she committed again. She had an affair with another guy. Uh, and it was discovered again, so that time, the second time was more serious, uh, which means you have a enlarged group of people talking to her and uh, saying, uh, because in China, I don't know, the Chinese tradition is that, you know, uh, you all, always, um, maybe the, the uh, phrase is, you know, every Chinese is, I mean, you know, uh, you don't like to, to be uh, uh, openly criticized or, uh, or you know, face saving. This is very important with, uh, with the Chinese tradition. So, you know, when you have an enlarged group of people talk to you, of course, naturally more people would know, you know, your mistake. So this is more serious. And, uh, but after the second time, it didn't work. She committed a third time. You know, again, she committed adultery. So then, of course, the leadership felt this was quite serious um, because her husband, you know, this was maybe you, it's hard for you to understand. When the organization discovered that she committed adultery, uh, nobody uh, told her husband about her affair with the other guy. Uh, the reasoning was that you don't want to disrupt the family life. You know, try to reason with her, uh, make her correct her own behavior. But in the meantime, you don't want to hurt the others, particularly she has three children. So, uh, you know, sometimes you feel it's, it's uh, kind of ridiculous because you know, a lot of people know, but the only one who doesn't know is her husband that uh, she's she's having an affair with somebody else. <clears throat> but the, uh, at the third time, um, the organization was uh, getting impatient and the people also around her felt, you know, she's very unfair to her husband this way. So, um, you know, people began to talk, you know, if you continue this way, you know, maybe your husband would discover and, uh, you know, this would really disrupt your own family life. What about your children and all that? So, of course, uh, by this time, you know, she, she also began to have a little cool-headed, you know, try to think that this is more serious. And usually in this kind of criticism, uh, critic meetings, this kind of meetings, uh, we would uh, try to talk to the person, to reason with the person, also try to find out the cause of this kind of behavior. Why she does it again, 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 and try to help her to review her own life. Why you, why you feel you, you have to fall in love with another guy? What's, what's bothering you? you know, what, what's behind all this? So finally, uh, we analyzed with her, and um, she talked about her childhood, she talked about her, her, um, her present life, she talked about what she reads, what she, you know, what she thinks, Oh, finally, uh, with a whole group, we figured out, uh, and she agreed, that she was deeply influenced by the uh, classic French literature. You see, she was a fan of Barzac. You know. from, from very, very early age, she read all the translation. You know, the Chinese translation work was very good. You know, we translated the whole works of Barzak and uh, Tolstoyevsky and, uh, you know, all the uh, great writers of the uh, 18th and 19th centuries of French and uh, Russian and, and in English. Uh, so she, she was a fan of Barzak and she read all the translated works of Barzak and she really felt, you know, she used to, used to imagine and put herself in that kind of, you know, pos position of certain uh, heroines in, in Barzak no novel. 
and she told us that the, um, one, of, one of the novels uh, in, of Barzak novels well, where the heroine you know, said uh, a husband is not enough, you, know, you must have a lover at the same time. And evidently, you know, she, she imagined about it, she had this kind of uh, illusions or whatever, and she put it into practice. So she, she again and again fell in love with someone else. Uh, not that she, she hated her husband. No, she said she doesn't hate her husband. She doesn't, you know, but she just felt this is more romantic if I have a husband and I have a lover at the same time, you know. So <coughs> this, this was the, you know, the kind of uh, uh, impact you'll find uh, because, you know, when she first committed this kind of uh, um, mistake, uh, sh both she and we didn't understand you know, what caused it until finally we, we tried to talk it out, tried to analyze, uh, and she really uh, went very deep into her own thinking. Uh, then she found out she was influenced by that kind of novel. You know. So the facts, these facts really proved that art and literature do exert a great influence on mental and social consciousness. So if we handle it caref carelessly, it could give people wrong ideas and could be poisonous to people's minds. So because of this kind of experience, uh, we realize, like in Chinese society, the workers and peasants, they need the service of intellectuals. Mm -hmm. They need to unite with the intellectuals. Providing the intellectuals, uh, providing these intellectuals share the same goal as they have. Uh, so to put this idea in a common sense, which means um, in the Chinese society, the workers and peasants, they are the people who are responsible for producing material wealth for Chinese societies to develop. But the cultural workers, the, the people in superstructure, they're responsible for creating spiritual wealth for the Chinese society to develop. This is the division of labor between wor production workers, peasants, and superstructure, the people in sub superstructure, work in superstructure. So, uh, when you think in such terms, then the next question is, you see the workers and peasants, they're responsible to feed us, to clothe us, to build buildings for us to live in. And the things they produce has to be um, good uh, and uh, gradually make it more and more perfect and also healthy for us, right? They, they produce food for us, it can't be poisonous because otherwise we'll, we'll be dead. Uh, and if anybody try to put poison in the food we eat, then he'll be caught as a counter-revolutionary, enemy of the people. So there's no problem with <coughs> workers and peasants. Whatever they produce is good for the society. Uh, accumulate the material wealth for the society and it got to be healthy, good. But for the other part, for us, cultural workers, what we produce, whether this is really good for the development of the society, whether it is healthy for the society, this is abstract. How to measure this? Because it's possible for us to produce something harmful for the society, spiritually but may not, we may not be caught right away. Not like a worker put poison in the food, then he'll be discovered very quickly. But if we put something, some wrong ideas, some poisonous ideas into people's minds, uh, we may not be caught right away. Uh, it's very, um, very tricky the kind of things that we, we produce, how to measure this, whether it's good or bad for the society. So 
any ideological, uh, ideological influence which is detrimental to this effort is impermissible in Chinese society. Uh, maybe you can put in a little bit because it's abstract, you're not caught right away, but sooner or later when they evaluate the work, uh, measure the reactions, measure the social effect of your work, uh, they'll discover uh, what is good, what is bad, because the goal is there, what we want. Um, <clears throat> So because of the majority of the Chinese people want to protect, protect the moral of this new society, uh, so this is our responsible. This is the way they me measure your work. So some people ask, uh, is this brainwashing? I think if you want to put it in this way, I agree with this. It is brainwashing. Uh, but I want to point out one fact. That is, I think everybody's thinking is determined by his social being, by his environment, by the people around him. 